Good to see you all today. Just a few announcements as we get started. Last week we mentioned a community outreach possibility where we're trying to support the needy families of Wilmington who don't have money to supply, have school supplies for their children. And it's $25 per child. If you can do one child, that'd be great, or even a portion, that would be fine. And those checks can be made out to the church or just note that on your envelope. And uh, last Sunday will be the last opportunity for that. Also, our small group studies will be starting in another week or two. And there is a list of groups in the lobby. Let your small group leader know if you'll be attending that so we can be sure of how many books uh, we might need to order yet. And most of the groups in the church here will be meeting in the sanctuary and, and spread out. So we'll keep safe with all that. On First and Second Peter, subtitled, Courage in Times of Trouble. Sound relevant? Hopefully it will be to all of us. And we're still in need of a Sunday school teacher or two, helper or two. Um, just to serve once a month in that capacity, and we're looking at starting Sunday School October 4th. Um, see Julie for more information on that. And there's a training coming up the 27th of this month from 1045 to 1215 for teachers and helpers. Okay, please stand if you're able. Join with me in our prayer, encouraging our hearts as to why we've come today. God, I've come today to lift my heart and voice to bless you, to meet with you, and to be blessed by you. Thank you for being here to meet with me. Psalm 135, first few verses share. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, you servants of the Lord. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to his name, for that is pleasant. I know that the Lord is great, that our Lord is greater than all gods. Now, in that culture, they believe there are many gods, like some people do today, but there is only one God. But we tend to have our idols. So God is greater than anything that we want to elevate and put on a pedestal in our lives. May we acknowledge his greatness as we worship him. Man, let's see if I got everything. Notebooks, check. Markers. Okay, good. Crayons. Pencils, pens. Ruler. Okay, got that. Deck of playing cards. Must be for math. I don't know. Mask. Never had to bring that before. And of course, you can't go to school these days out for one of these anymore, can you? A laptop, a computer. We need all these things. So what am I ready for? School. Time to go back to school. Whatever that might mean to you, right? Some of you kids are probably real excited about going back to school. Some of your parents are probably real excited about you going back to school. Um, some of you might be feeling pretty sad that summer's over. Uh, as a child, I loved going back to school, but I also was sad summer was over because I loved both. It's probably why I became a teacher, so I could go back to school every year of my life, okay? Uh, some of you are probably feeling nervous, a little scared about going back to school. It's not exactly the same as it was before with the corona stuff going on, and you might be going, you're going to have a new teacher, so that's something you got to get used to. You might even be going to a different school building. Um, new kids are going to be there that you've got to meet and get to know. All these things can make us feel a little bit apprehensive. And I'm going to tell you a secret. 
all your teachers feel the same way about all those things, okay? They're having those same feelings, uh, especially with all the COVID going on. Some of you are gonna do remote learning, and some of you are doing hybrid learning. These are words we didn't even have before that we talked about, okay? Well, on the first day of school, the teacher would probably ask you some questions, wanna see where you're at, what you know. And when the teacher asks you a question to which you know the answer, you know, yeah, 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 I know, I know, call on me, I know the answer. It feels good to know the answer to a question, doesn't it? And it helps us to relax a little bit and think, okay, I'm gonna be all right. Well, in our Bible lesson today, the disciples, now a disciple is a learner, a follower, okay? They were going back to school. They'd actually been going to school for about three years now, okay? And they were like 20 and 30 and 40 years old. So you see, you're never too old to keep learning new stuff. And who is the disciples' teacher? Jesus, right? Jesus is the disciples' teacher. He often took his disciples aside to teach them some more lessons about the kingdom of God. You see, he was preparing them to go on and make disciples. You have to be a disciple before you can make disciples, all right? And he knew what was coming. He was getting them ready, all right? And in today's lesson, Jesus starts the lesson with a question. It's a good way to get people's attention, get them thinking. And he said, hey guys, what do other men, who do other men say that I am? So one of them knew the answer. I know, I know. Some of them say you're John the Baptist. What do you think, guys? Is that a good answer, John the Baptist? Now think about it. John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin, just a little bit older. And Jesus, John and Jesus were together at the Jordan River, and John the Baptist baptized Jesus. So how anybody could think Jesus was John, I don't get that one. So no, that was not the right answer, okay? Another one raises his hand and goes, a lot of people are saying you're Elijah. Elijah lived 700 years ago in the Old Testament. He's the guy that went up in a whirlwind and a chariot of fire, you know, went up to heaven. Don't think that's who Jesus is. And another guy said, well, some are saying you're Jeremiah or one of the Old Testament prophets. Anybody think they had the right answers? Okay, Jesus said, good job. You've been listening to what people are saying, and that's okay. But now I want to ask you another question. Who do you say that I am? And Peter, you know Peter, he didn't even remember to raise his hand. He just shouted out, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He was so excited to know the answer. And Jesus said, you are right, Peter. And you didn't learn that from listening to other people, what they're saying. That was taught to you by my Father in heaven. Jesus was saying that God was his father and that he was the son of the living God. No mistake about it. He was owning that. Because a lot of people say Jesus never said he was the son of God. Well, he just did, okay? The disciples, the lesson that the disciples were learning that day is just as important today as it was back then. We need to know who Jesus is. Do you know? Do you know who he is? Do you know he's the Christ, the Son of the living God? How do you know that? Where do you find your information? God's word, the Bible. Some people say it's a love letter uh, to us, for us to know uh, who it is. Now, some people, when they read God's word, they say, there's nothing in there for me. I get nothing out of it, nothing whatsoever. Other people say, well, it's all right. It's got some interesting stories, and there's some good history in there. It's okay got some good ideas on how to live my life. But people that know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, say no. This is an exciting, colorful book. We, it's words of life for us. It's exciting. We want to know everything that's in it. Now, when the disciples were talking with Jesus that day, they didn't know everything that was going to happen yet. Okay, they knew they had, Jesus got born, and they knew that he got baptized by John. And they knew he had walked on water and that he had fed the 5,000 people and told the woman at the well about Jesus. But this had not happened yet when they, they had that lesson. They had not had the Last Supper. Jesus had not died on the cross. He was trying to tell them what was going to happen, but they weren't getting it. But we know that Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, because he loved God, he obeyed his father and came to earth. Because he loves us, the people, he was willing to go to the cross and die on the cross to take away all our sin and to give us forgiveness. He did that out of love. And then, the best part, we know that Jesus was buried, but on the third day, he came back to life. That shows that 
Jesus was God, is God, because he had the power over sin and death. And he did that to bring life to all of us, did in the everlasting life and to be with us forever. That is what we know about Jesus. And that is what we want to tell other people when they ask us who Jesus is. Um, so when we want to do this, the Bible says in 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared. That's a good scout verse, right, James? OK. And it says to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that is in you. Hopefully, as good disciple makers and good disciples, people can see the hope and the joy of Jesus in us and say, what do you got that I haven't got? And you can tell them it's Jesus. And it says, do this with gentleness and respect. So remember that part, too. So we want to love God, love people, and make disciples. And to do that, we have to be a disciple. OK, so when you're going back to school, you've got to be a learner. Be learning in this book especially, okay? Let's pray. Father, when people are searching for the answer to the question, who is Jesus, help us all to be ready with the answer. And Lord, I pray for all our children as they go back to school and begin a new year of school. Please protect them in every way. Help them to learn well. Help them to be good disciples. And help them remember how much you love them and that you are always with them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I have blank pages, too. <laughs> so this is the final message in our series on Abraham we've been doing for the summer. Only a few people in the Bible have pretty much their life story laid out as Abraham does in Scripture. Genesis 25, verses 1 through 11, we're looking at this morning gives us really a brief obituary of Abraham, listing his family, followed by a few sentence eulogy. And there's actually a larger eulogy in Hebrews chapter 11, where Abraham's given 12 verses. Moses is only given six. What are some things we can learn from Abraham's life? How do we want to be thought of by others both now as well as when we're gone. Genesis 25, verses 1 through 11 states, Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Maiden, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan was the father of Sheba and Dadan, the descendants of Dadan were the Asherites, the Latushites. I'll move on. The Leumites. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Apher, Hanak, Abida, and Elda. All these were descendants of Keturah. Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac. But while he was still living, he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. Altogether, Abraham lived 175 years. And again, that seems crazy today, but germs, disease, and sickness had not yet fully encapsulated the whole human race yet as they do today. They lived a lot longer back then because there weren't the diseases there are today. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years. And he was gathered to his people. His son Isaac, sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave at Machpelah near Mamre, in the field of Ephron, son of Zahar the Hittite, the field Abraham had bought from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with his wife, Sarah. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son, Isaac, who then lived near Be'er Lahai Louis. 
First thing it's important to understand about Abraham, number one in your outline, Abraham had a fallen, sinful human nature, just like we all do. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, everyone born since has born with a human nature that desires to be our own boss, to be our own God, and not to submit to God's will for our lives. Not to love God and serve God and love and serve others. Paul tells us in Romans 3.10, there is no one righteous, not even one. He says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory, the holiness of God. A few instances we've already looked at in previous messages. He told his wife Sarah to lie to Pharaoh's men and tell them she was his sister and not his wife because he was afraid they might kill him when they wanted to take Sarah to be a part of Pharaoh's harem. So here he sacrificed his wife's purity for his own safety. His fear and lack of faith caused him to plot and scheme and deceive instead of telling the truth and relying on God. Then there was a time Sarah grew impatient with God's timing of bringing a child into the world through them. So she asked Abraham, now why don't you have relationship with one of our servants, Hagar, and maybe she will bear us a son. He did, and Ishmael was born. Abraham again neglected his responsibility. What should he have said to Sarah? Sarah, no. God has promised he would give us a child. We need to trust him in this and take him at his word. But he may have grown tired of waiting as well, so maybe they thought they'd help God along a little bit. And in our verses for today, this is the first time Keturah is mentioned. There's disagreement among biblical scholars as to the timing of their relationship. Some say she married Abraham after Sarah died. Abraham then had six sons with her. So what they say then is God's miracle, 37 years earlier, of Abraham and Sarah conceiving a child with Isaac, that miracle of Abraham's sexual vitality continued not just 37 years, but long enough to have six more boys. Other scholars believe that Keturah was a concubine. Abraham seemed to have a few because verse six says he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines. There was Hagar as well as Keturah. A concubine was a female slave who functioned as a secondary wife and surrogate mother. They were sometimes spoils of war or bought from a poverty-stricken family. The children were regarded not as illegitimate, but kind of a supplementary family. Though this was never God's will for his people, it was very popular in that culture. But even if one believes Abraham did not have relationship with Keturah until after Sarah died, there's these other situations that proves Abraham had a fallen, Sinful human nature, just like we do, just like every human being. But along with his propensity to sin against God that we all have, it's also important to realize, number two, Abraham was a person of faith. Part of his New Testament eulogy, if you will, from Hebrews chapter 11 states, by faith, Abraham when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, 
obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God, that heavenly city later to come. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sands of the seashore. And it's verses 17 to 19. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, the son of the promise, if you will. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. These verses show that even though there were times when Abraham's trust in God to keep his word and fulfill his promises was weak, and there were horrible consequences to his decisions made during those times. Overall, his trusting relationship with God grew to the point that he was willing to follow God's word and potentially sacrifice Isaac. Think about that. Knowing he was the son of the promise, believing that God would even raise him from the dead. That's how much his faith had grown over the years, to the point of his willingness to do that, in obedience to God's still small voice and his word. But God provided a different sacrifice with the ram in the thicket. So because Abraham had servants, really slaves, whom he had fathered children by, should we take him out of the history books and out of the Bible? Should we cancel all the good he did because of the mistakes he made? God doesn't. He looks at the totality of a person's life, and he calls us to do the same. One of the most beloved hymns of the Christian faith, Amazing Grace, was written by a man who was formerly a slave trader, and by his own admission, a wretch of a man. But John Newton repented of his sin, was dramatically tr transformed by the gospel as he became a Christian. Newton became a supporter and an inspiration to William Wilberforce, who led the fight to pass the British Slave Trade Act in 1807, which abolished the slave trade in the British colonies. Instead of deleting amazing grace from our worship songs. We sing it as a testament to the fact that God can change a person's life. A testament to the fact that God can change a heart. A heart that sees others as inferior and property to, property to be owned. To a heart that sees others having infinite worth and value as brothers and sisters in this one human race to which we all belong. One of the lyrics of Amazing Grace is, I was blind, I just didn't understand. 
but now I see. It is so important that we extend grace to those who've lived in past cultures where slavery was the accepted custom of the day, whether Abraham or our founding fathers, to acknowledge, yes, to acknowledge and learn from their mistakes, but also to acknowledge the good they had done to change our society, to change and further the kingdom of God at times even. God looks at his people through eyes of grace and not judgment. This leads us to number three. Abraham was forgiven by God. What cancel culture fails to understand in their strictly humanistic, non-spiritual worldview is the necessity and the freedom that comes with forgiveness. God says in Jeremiah 31, 34, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The Hebrew word for remember here doesn't mean to recall, but to dwell on. God is not saying he hits the delete button and wipes our sin away from his memory forever. It means when we confess our sins to God, our shortcomings, our struggles, he forgives, he chooses not to hold it against us. He never brings it up and holds it over our heads. It's forgiven, it's gone, it's wiped out. It's forgiven and gone and wiped out because of what Christ has done on the cross for us. All that sin against God has been paid in full. The debt that we each owe to God, and it's huge for all of our sins against Him. Scripture says, has been canceled out completely, it's been paid in full. Now we're supposed to try to understand both in previous cultures as well as today. Why are people the way they are? Why were they the way they were? Maybe it's because of their upbringing. What did they learn from their parents, from their grandparents, from the society and culture they lived in? How were they treated? The moment a person understands we've sinned against God, the holy God of the universe, and we deserve his righteous judgment for all of our sin, the moment we realize all that judgment was placed upon Christ on the cross, scripture is very clear that God wipes out, he cancels all that debt that we have owed to him. And God looks at you and me in Christ as clean, as freshly fallen snow. Completely clean before him. So we need to be careful in the way we relate to other people presently or people of the past. Whom God forgives, he sets free. Yes, we need to acknowledge their struggles and learn from them, but we need to extend grace. And when we mess up today, and we do, God does not cancel out our relationship with him. We are still his children whom he loves unconditionally held securely by his all-powerful 
hand of grace. And he's never, ever going to let us go. Leads us to number four. In spite of the times Abraham messed up in his life, Abraham was called a friend of God. Not just once, but three times in the Bible, Abraham is called the friend of God. Isaiah 41.8 records God himself declaring, But you, O Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. In spite of all the times Abraham had messed up and sinned against God in his life, God still called Abraham his friend because of the relationship they had with one another. Think about that. Not just in Abraham's life, but in your life if you're a follower of Christ. If you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, even though you and I still mess up more than we would like to admit. The infinite, all-knowing, all-powerful creator God of the universe calls you his friend, loved by him, accepted by him. And this is because Abraham's relationship with God, as well as our own, is not based on our performance and our trying to earn God's love or earn acceptance or earn anything else from Him. Our relationship with Him is based totally on God's amazing grace, undeserved favor, unconditional love. We're all flawed human beings. And yet in relationship with God through Christ, he accepts us and he calls us his friends. Does someone have to be perfect because before you will have them as a friend of yours? I hope not or you're not gonna have any friends, right? Because none of us are perfect. Does a historical figure have to be perfect before we honor them for their accomplishments? Or like God with Abraham, are we able to acknowledge their flaws, forgive them, learn from their mistakes, and honor them for the good they did? We come now to a fifth thing seen in this eulogy of Abraham in Genesis 25. Abraham was a caring father. He no doubt spent a lot of time with his son Ishmael as he grew up as an only child the first 14 years of his life. Probably taught Ishmael about being a herdsman, how to care for the flock. Maybe they sat under the stars at night and just talked about life. But when Ishmael was 16 or 17, Sarah caught him mocking his little half-brother, Isaac. He may have been frustrated, even though he was the firstborn son of Abraham, Isaac was going to get all the inheritance because that's the way it was in that culture. Would this then lead to a greater bitterness and resentment as Isaac grew up? So Abraham obeyed God and sent Hagar and his son Ishmael away, knowing that God would take care of them. We read earlier in Genesis 25, 9 and 10 that both Isaac and Ishmael buried Abraham with Sarah. So Abraham must have continued some kind of relationship with Ishmael over the years. How did Abraham treat his six other sons born to Keturah? Verses 5 and 6 state, Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac, but while he was still living, he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. 
knowing that the children of concubines were not given any inheritance in that culture, Abraham gave each one a substantial gift while he was still alive. And some commentators believe that what he gave them was a small herd, each six sons a small herd to begin their own business. And the way, the same way Abraham had great difficulty in sending Ishmael away, he probably shed quite a few tears in sending these other six sons away as well. We're told why he sent them away in verse 6. He sent them away from his son, Isaac. He sent them away to the east, present-day Arabia, because he didn't want to do anything to happen that would hinder Isaac bringing descendants into the world. And through those descendants, the eventual Messiah, the Christ, would come. His decision was based on what was best for the kingdom of God, rather than what was best for him or potentially his family. So we come lastly to number six. Abraham left a legacy to follow. Verse eight shares, altogether Abraham lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years. And he was gathered to his people. The phrase full of years here isn't so much about the length of life that Abraham lived, it's more about the quality of his life. The word carries the idea of a satisfied life. Again, it's not that Abraham didn't have regrets and wished he had done things differently at times in his life. But as he looked back on the whole of his life, he was satisfied in that he had fulfilled God's purposes for his life his purposes of leaving a legacy that would last, where his spiritual influence in particular would last through Isaac and generation to generation to generation. That spiritual legacy seen in verse 11 after Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac, who then lived near Be'er, Lahai Rui. God's blessing on Isaac came from his father's trust in God's promises and his being a friend of God. It came from Abraham's relationship with God and his fulfilling of God's purposes for his life. And now God's promise given to Abraham initially was also his promise given to Isaac that through Isaac's lineage, the Messiah would come. In Abraham's eulogy, if you will, we've seen that he had a fallen nature just like the rest of us. Even though he was a person of tremendous faith in God to fulfill his promises, at times, that faith wavered, and he made lousy decisions that had horrendous consequences. But God didn't disown him and cancel him out. God forgave him. And in relationship with God, God called Abraham his friend, loved by him, dear to him, important to him. Abraham was also a caring father, and he left a legacy to follow. And that legacy was a legacy of faith. What kind of legacy do we want to leave for our children, for our grandchildren? What kind of influence do we want to have in our friends? 
that legacy for a follower of Christ must be a spiritual legacy. It must be a legacy of faith. And what I'm about to say has absolutely nothing to do with me being a pastor. Do you hear that? Nothing with me being a pastor. When I die, I want people saying more than, what a nice person he was. Hopefully that'll be true. But it's got to be deeper than that. It's what did he do in loving God? I want to be known, what did I do to show my love for God? What did I do to show my love for other people? And what did I do to leave a legacy of faith in making disciples? That's the legacy that lasts by definition. When I'm here and gone, I trust family will remember me. You may remember me, but in a generation, nobody's going to remember that I existed. But if I leave a legacy of faith from generation that goes to generation, it goes to generation, then my faith legacy lives on. That's God's calling on our lives as his people, to leave a legacy of faith. And if we don't have children, if we're single, that legacy can happen in our relationship with with extended family, with friends, with other people. Let's pray. Lord, as long as we are alive, we have the opportunity to add what will be shared in our eulogy we have the opportunity to add to the spiritual legacy of our faith relationship with you as we strive to pass that on to others. Give us the grace, God, to be more intentional, not just about being a nice person and not just about living for you, but leaving a legacy by passing your truth on to others, your gospel truth, especially to the next generation. It's for your glory and honor and for the sake of your kingdom that we ask these things. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. God bless. Have a good week. You may reapply your masks and our ushers will dismiss you from rear to front.